to talk about outliving our evolutionary legacy. I have no stated conflicts of interest, to, no conflicts of interest to state. Uh, I'm going to be talking about bioidentical hormone therapy, not as a pharmaceutical silver bullet, but as part of the complex web with which we've all learned to address every problem since we become paleolithic physicians. We did talk about a uh, systems approach to medicine, a couple, to medical problems a couple times today, and we did it as well um, last year when Tommy Wood showed us a great presentation of addressing a multiple sclerosis case, all the different uh, factors that can be considered when someone has multiple sclerosis, and we talked about Dale Bredesen's great study about uh, involving interventions in Alzheimer's disease that are not one but 20 plus interventions that had remarkable benefit far better than any drug. And if we take even something simple like osteoporosis, we know that in fact there are a lot of factors that make osteoporosis a fairly frequent problem, particularly in older women and somewhat in older men. We know that many things have to work together either well or poorly to predict the health of someone's bones. Uh, the hormones in your body have to be in some sweet spot. Your glucocorticoids can't be too high, whether they're endogenous or exogenous primarily. The sex hormones have to be high enough, and other hormones are involved too, including insulin, which I'm sure Jeff could talk to us more about. Then there's local growth factors that affect the, um, the pull on the bone and whether it creates, lays down new trabecular bone, and the vitamin D level. And we can take, if we're taking a systems approach, we can take any one of these individual factors and look at it systemically. So we take something like vitamin D, and we know that for people as they age, and I told you I have kind of a, for some reason, idiosyncratic interest in aging, uh, levels of vitamin D naturally decline in people that, a that age, and we know that has to do with their skin architecture, their dietary choices, which become more restricted in people as they age. We don't impair, we don't absorb vitamin D as well as we get older and um, impaired activation of the D that we absorb. And that creates a lot of problems. So we can follow vitamin D deficiency further and see all the things that that can influence from osteoporosis to cognitive impairment, diminished libido. All these areas have been associated with vitamin D deficiency, and there's reason to think about smart vitamin D supplementation in all of them. So, okay, I tend to talk fast. <clears throat> I'm going to take a breath, sing a trill, slow down. We can go back to sex hormones and kind of do the same thing that we did with vitamin D. We know that sex hormones decline with age, and that that lowering of sex hormones is associated with a lot of negative outcomes. Um, osteoporosis, people don't sleep as well as their sex hormones decline. In general, their ability to function, activities of daily living is compromised, their metabolism is deranged, you have an increase in metabolic syndrome that correlates with the loss of sex hormones, cognitive impairment, diminished libido. It actually, actually looks like a lot like the vitamin D list, doesn't it? Which is, of course, another hormone just not a sex hormone. So from an evolutionary perspective, uh, you know, there's talk about, well, Grok died young, so why do we even care about the ancestral perspective? But as anybody in this room knows, if uh, prehistoric men and women survived childbirth, <laughs> um, infancy, the traumas of adolescence, they were as likely to live to late, middle, or early advanced age as we are now. So their life expectancy was something like 65 to 75, and very a few outliers lived up to the age of 90. And if you present that kind of information at Paleo FX, they'll go, ah, oh, that's great, I'm good. But if you pre uh, present this information at an AARP meeting, that's not so reassuring. Um, to adopt a Paleolithic lifestyle, it would make a healthier elder grok. You know, from if you're above the age of 50 or 60 and you've uh, stopped living in sin at some point, as Bob put it this morning, you will be a healthier grok, but grok's still going to die sometime between 65 and 95 without medical intervention. But we're going to all have medical interventions, and we're going to live longer. Stuff really does wear out. Um, 
Digestive systems change as we age. We make less stomach acid, we have less motility. Our brains and our bones change and their function really weakens as we get older. And fertility, now this is, fertility is an interesting point to consider because really that's what evolution is all about. It, there's something called in the literature now called the grandmother hypothesis. If I had a pointer, do I have a pointer? Okay, so this is the non-gender associated elder grok and really that's the best we can hope for if we live the life of a healthy paleolithic person. The young people are all reproducing. Reproduction takes a tremendous toll on a woman's body and it is really good for the species for me to stop having babies when I'm in my 40s or, or certainly at 50. And as I serve some purpose as an elder person in the community in the role of grandmother. So this is the grandmother hypothesis in current evolutionary thinking that it's really better for me not to have functional hormones for the benefit of the community. But what about me? How many of you have ever heard somebody say, Hor hormone replacement therapy is bad because, raise your hand if a patient has ever ha said to you, hormone replacement therapy is bad because it causes breast cancer and heart disease. How many people have ever heard a colleague say that? How many people still think it themselves? Okay, great, I'm glad there's a few of you who learned something in this talk. So we want to address the, the you know, for years, postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy was given based on my initial slide that there's so many functions that women lose as they age. As you know, women's sex hormones decline rather precipitously at the age of menopause and men slowly taper over their lifetime. And it was observed, all these things that happen to older women, not younger women, let's give them hormone replacement therapy and we kind of know how that, those first experiments turned out. Um, but there's, more, there's subsequent knowledge, but it, it behooves us to look at all these areas. Vascular and metabolic disease, breast cancer, how well do our brains function, urinary tract infections, and bone density. And uh, the urinary tract infection sounds little, but it's big. You know, how often have we all treated an elderly person in the ER <clears throat> with sepsis and had to admit them? So. Um, Prior to the WHI study, which is now what everybody bases that understanding on, breast cancer or heart disease, uh, we noticed that there, we observed, we didn't study, that there was a 40 to 50 percent reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease <coughs> for those who use estrogen, whether or not they use a progestin with it. And there were a number of studies that showed that, but something niggled in the back of our brain, which is that oral contraceptive users clearly had an increased risk of thromboembolic disease, so maybe it's really not so good for older women to use, so we better look at it. Is it a benefit or is it a hazard? So the WHI came out and its first report was legendary. Maybe you re I remember exactly where I was when I heard that the WHI had been interrupted. This is like Kennedy dying, you know. Um, in 2002, it came out in JAMA because everything they were studying was getting a lot worse. And the, the, but which of these interventions um, stopped the study? Do you know which of these interventions was the main one to stop the study in 2002? Actually, not any of these. That was a trick question. Um, the answer is breast cancer. That was the motivation for stopping the study, and we will talk about that, but all of these should have been enough. The key thing to remember is that study, as it came out in 2002, the intervention was conjugated equine estrogens by mouth in combination with medroxyprogesterone, um, also by mouth, in that combination pill known as Prempro. I like to think of in some ways of the WHI as like herpes, it's the gift that keeps on giving. There have been more <laughs> studies that have come out of the WHI than almost anything. And the thing we need to, the first thing to pay attention to which did not get headlines, I didn't see this when it came out. You know, my history is that, so I went into menopause a little bit before the 2002 study came out in 2000. 
And my mother died of breast cancer, and her mother had breast cancer, and I had my only child late in life. And I was very wary about proceeding into menopause with hormones. So I was treating my menopause herbally at this point, and definitely when the 2002 study came out. I didn't hear about the 2004 study that came out, um, and that was the, <coughs> they looked retrospectively at the data, and they said, let's take a subset of women who had had hysterectomies, so they just received conjugated es equine estrogens. And the numbers are quite different. Whereas these were all the increased risk numbers, this is relative risk, um, on the women who had Prempro, the women who just had Premarin had markedly different outcomes. So they all had, act they actually had statistically significant decreased risk of, of coronary heart disease and non-fatal MI, but they still had an increased risk of stroke and venous disease, uh, thromboembolic disease. So it still doesn't look so safe when you consider some of the, de you know, obviously devastating effects of stroke. But if you add a few more rows to this um, comparison, you can see that breast cancer goes from being increased with Prempro to actually being significantly decreased with Premarin. Um, hip fractures uh, are reduced in both. Colon cancer was only studied in this one. It was probably the only Hip fractures and colon cancer were the only good thing that came out of WHI, but all cancers were reduced with simple Premarin. Um, overall mortality was not that different in the study that, um, as it was carried out so far to that time. Uh, looking more specifically, okay, so the thorny area in vascular disease is really thromboembolic disease and the strokes that can result from that. We know that, um, so how, how this study has evolved, oh, these are a little bit out of order, that, that oral, <coughs> oral, I need to take singing lessons, don't I? Oral hormone replacement therapy is actually, has a negative impact on our coagulation markers and venous thromboembolism, and that actually explains the bad history with birth control pills, the relative in, in, increased incidence of stroke in young women on birth control pills. But subsequent studies have shown that there's actually no increase in the risk of, of blood clotting disorders or stroke in those who use transdermal hormone replacement therapy. It also it has a negligible effect on markers of inflammation, which are increased with oral estrogen. So transdermal estrogen is a completely different ball of wax than oral estrogen taken orally. And when you actually run it through a randomized trial, which wasn't done until, which was done shortly after, but again, this is something that hasn't received a lot of attention. So these are women who'd had a hysterectomy and they're only followed for seven months but both forms of estrogen, reduced glucose and fibrinogen, uh, didn't change those inflammatory markers. The oral estrogen did cause a greater in increase in HSCRP, um, and the oral actually improved the lipid pr uh, profile a little bit more than transdermal. So it, it becomes a more complicated, hormones become more complicated, you have to ask, what kind of hormones you're talking about. And it turns out that the benefit from the transdermal hormones is that, so uh, this is a, a review article that looked at all the studies and the mechanisms proposed in them, that the transdermal bypasses the hepatic metabolism and gives us more uh, stable serum levels. This, this, uh, this review of the literature was done by Michael Goodman, who's a practitioner in, in Davis, California. Um, so there's less hepatic, so the, the coagulation effects of the oral estrogen come from activities in the liver, and we get less of that if you don't go through the liver to absorb your estrogen. Uh, they both benefit lipids. The transdermal has less, it has a more beneficial effect on, or a less of a negative effect on, oh, there's like that something, water's leaking out of the sky. Condensation. Condensation, okay. Whereas the oral, the Premarin, increases sex hormone binding globulin, has this other little side effect. So in menopause, when women's estrogen and progesterone goes down, slowly their testosterone goes down as well, and the, uh, which has, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, 
and the oral makes that worse. It uh, lowers the testosterone availability. So really, what we know if we pull all our medicine together, not just the information we have gathered on the hormone therapy, is that the cause of thromboembolic disease, blood clotting, is multifactorial. It's clear that the oral hormones are more hazardous than transdermal, but that we can actually do laboratory tests to see where somebody is. What are their markers of coagulation? We can look at their genetics, and we'll do that a little bit with 23andMe. Um, but we, if somebody has a higher risk from all these factors that we look at, and we want to, if I want to put them on hormone replacement therapy, I'll check not only their genetics, but what their actual coagulation markers are, and we can modify it. We can modify it with fish oil, we can modify it with natokinase. Um, I use those rather than aspirin. So the, the first area then of uh, precautions against using hormone replacement therapy, cardiovascular disease doesn't really stand up when you take out the progestin, and this didn't have the, pro there is a progesterone study, but it's going to show up in here. Um, and you apply the hormones transdermally. So if we go on to the next major area of concern, and the one that stopped the study uh, was breast cancer. So the WHI showed that the relative risk of taking both hormones together significantly increased the risk of breast cancer. And when you took the medroxyprogesterone out, it was a reduced risk, but the numbers weren't substantial enough to make it statistically significant. Happily, you know, the, the question in my mind has been, some of this work was done before the WHI was ever set up, so why they chose these particular hormones, I can't perhaps figure unless the pharmaceutical profit potentially yielded from Prempro was different than um, regular estrogen and progesterone. May have something to do with it, but in, so overseas where there's nationalized uh, health insurance, France, we have a cohort study that is uh, more helpful to us if we want to think about not using the hormones that can be particularly hazardous. So we, we know we want to take out that progestin. We know that the estradiol is beneficial for women regarding breast health, but we can't give estradiol alone if they still have a uterus because then they can get uh, cancer of the lining of the uterus, endometrial cancer. So when you use, um, and this is, these are all just breast cancer relative risks, estradiol alone, uh, orally, in this French cohort study of 80,000 women, so this is an observational study, not an interventional study, the relative risk actually showed an increase in breast cancer, but it was not statistically significant, as did the transdermal alone, but when you added in progestins, you got that same number that we saw in the WHI study, a significant increase in breast cancer. But when you added in progesterone, quite statistically significantly, there was no increase in breast cancer in those women using postmenopausal hormone therapy that consisted of these two hormones. Come on. Okay. Um, that didn't do it. Oh, so I, I point it here? No, it's just slow. It's okay. Frozen. So the only people that have been, um, the, who, <laughs> the only people, the only beings that have been subjected to autopsy, uh, you know, so that we can see what the tissues did, have been monkeys. So they took some postmenopausal monkeys. We're not the only mammal that lives past menopause, but we live more significantly past menopause probably because of medical intervention than other species, but monkeys do live past menopause. And when monkeys were given <laughs> estradiol and medroxyprogesterone, their breast tissue showed significant proliferation, whereas those who had estradiol and progesterone had no increased pro proliferation over estradiol alone. So that gives us an idea of a mechanism that could be hazardous for women or safe, depending on which progesterone is chosen. Happily, we know that with breast cancer, as with thromboembolic disease, there's a host of other modifiable factors. 
and um, I assume you're um, familiar with all of these, but these are all near and dear to my heart. So, you know, how much alcohol should people drink? And for if breast cancer was our only concern, women probably shouldn't drink alcohol at all. At all. But you show no increased risk if you go up to one drink a day, and you're better off doing one drink a day than um, one drink every week, or certainly than five or six drinks once a week. Uh, obesity is associated and definitely weight gain since adolescence, but it's not, and it has been looked at, associated with dietary fat or red meat. You know, that, uh, that certainly was the thought for a while. There were a number of studies, and, and that came from the nurses' study that they followed women, and the nurses particularly advised to be on low-fat diets, which they had to be on for a really long time, and they had no benefit of, of reduced breast cancer. And the one I forget because I hardly have any patients that smoke, but of course smoking's a big risk factor. Um, exercise, and they probably need to do the kind of exercise that, that Daryl suggests. Adequate, so this one, I don't know how much, how familiar you are with this, but um, adequate sleep in the dark. They've studied women who have adequate sleep, but sleep in rooms that have light coming in those women make less melatonin and they have an increased risk of breast cancer. So melatonin, even if you sleep well, you might have lower melatonin levels, particularly over the age of 50. And so one of my recommendations, and you can see it if you pick up Paleo Magazine this month, is that people the, over the age of 50 should, might consider giving supplemental melatonin a try and see what dose they can either tolerate or enjoy um, that might enhance their sleep and, and definitely is doing a lot of other work in their immune system. And if any of you, I don't know about conventional oncology, Dawn, but definitely my patients who see <coughs> naturopaths who have endometrial or breast cancer are put on very high doses of melatonin. Is that? I use myself, I use uh, 20 milligrams a day in some breast cancer patients. Just, you know, and I'm sure you're going to talk about this. Um, some people have a, uh, an undesirable reaction to melatonin, so you just have to try it and see so right. where they and fall on that. And, <coughs> and not everybody needs huge amounts to, to, to get a sleep effect, but if you're going for the hormonal effect, you do want the 20 milligrams a day. Yeah, I, I, I kind of recommend people go for the sleep effect unless they've got the, a cancer issue, and then they take as much as they can tolerate, and you can modify it. and. And if they don't sleep long enough, you can get a sustained release melatonin. You can take it again in the middle of the night. If they are still dopey the next morning, you can reduce the dose and, and have them take it earlier in the evening. What's the side effect? Dopey, can't wake up. Yeah. There are, in fact, some people who take melatonin in the morning. And I think that's effect. So you know melatonin exists in kind of an adversarial relationship with cortisol. And my theory is that the people who, been, who like taking melatonin in the morning, it's toning down their daytime cortisol and enabling it to taper off to more normal levels at night. But NPR had a study, they announced a study one time that's saying half of the people who take melatonin sh are happier taking it in the morning. I don't really have very many people that's true for, but I've seen it. And then there, when it comes, the next, the really uh, crucial area to think about with breast cancer risk reduction and prevention we all read Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, right? And there was Twas Brillig and the, I don't know, they told tales of cabbages and kings. So cabbages and kinks is what I think of next. Women who were Polish women in Poland eat cabbage, sulforaphanes, sulforaphanes in cruciferous vegetables at least three times a week. And when they moved to this country, if they maintain that habit of eating ca cabbage at least three times a week, they enjoy the lower breast cancer risk rate and occurrence rate that Polish women enjoy. If they become here and be if they move here and become truly Americanized and only eat cabbage as some form of sweetened coleslaw once every two weeks, they get an American woman's risk of breast cancer. So it's important. I s suggest to all women that if they're not eating cruciferous vegetables every day. They ought to consider um, an extract of cruciferous vegetables as a supplement. And then kinks. Uh, your DNA tells a lot about your susceptibility to handling these hormones 
that are now going to be circulating in your system. And of course, you all carefully, you know very well, I'm sure, this estrogen metabolism chart, how estrogens metabolize starting in the liver through phase one pathways. And these are, these are uh, actually all of them, but we don't know how to modify that one. These are all related to enzymes whose adequacy of function in your body are revealed on your 23andMe genetics test and they can all be impacted. Roughly 65% of breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive. The occurrence of SNPs in the population is actually quite high and one single SNP is probably harmless, but if it's estimated that you have multiple SNPs, say a SNP here, in the, and a SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism, that single chain like Daria was talking about in the milk that just changes one little nucleotide, half of one nucleotide pair in a gene region and impairs that gene's function by a predictable percent, a fairly predictable percent. It, these SNPs actually speed up uh, the transformation. So estrone more quickly becomes 2-hydroxy-E1 if you have this SNP. If you have this SNP, it becomes 4-hydroxy-E1 more quickly. And the red uh, metabol uh, intermediary metabolites are carcinogenic and the green ones are good for you. If you have that one and this one, if you have two SNPs, it's estimated to uh, increase your best breast cancer risk by anywhere from three to a factor of three to 12. So this is something to know about because they can also all be um, accommodated for. Just going through them a little bit one by one. The first one relates to our processing of both estrogens and hydrocarbons. And if someone has a SNP in this area, they can modify it by avoid, avoiding overtaxing the enzymes. And this is probably worse avoiding smoking comes into play. And you'll see a theme here, you can pay attention. You can boost the function, um, you can improve the outcome of a SNP in this area with cruciferous vegetables and, uh, or the extract, uh, indole-3-carbonyl or DIM. These are names for two slightly different chemical version, biochemical versions of the extracts of cruciferous vegetables. And some people do better with one and some people do better with another, but of course you don't know unless you do repeated testing of how you're metabolizing estrogen. So I like to combine them in one supplement. Uh, the next one, it kind of looks the same, doesn't it? These are reasons to not be smoking. You're overtaxing these enzymes that are helping your body metabolize estrogen. <coughs> this one has an additional counter with omega-3 fatty acids. Um, again, cruciferous vegetables. The second phase has to do, so the first phase we take the uh, hormones out of circulation and we modify them and at that point most of them are more carcinogenic. And then we do phase two detoxification that actually gets them ready for elimination. And the, oops, COMT gene has to do with applying methyl groups to these. Um, metabolites, and if you have SNPs in this, in this area, there's actually a suggestion of how much I have a, I'm, a, I'm heterozygous in COMT, so not only did my mother have breast cancer, but I have a 1.7 increased risk just because of that. And all these strategies help uh, normalize your function of your COMT. And optimizing methylation is very complicated because y there's a sweet spot. So <coughs> methylation, we all remember, is a carbon with three hydrogen atoms attached. Um, a doctor friend of mine told me that we do it a billion times a second. And the main pathway, and uh, we attach methyl groups to B vitamins and we send them off to, for them to hand off methyl groups to various other places throughout the body. And when that's impaired, everything can stop. And, and also this deficit builds up over time. There's something called the triage theory of aging that comes from, oh, that guy at Berkeley that did carcinogenic, what's that guy's? Yes, uh, Bruce Ames. Um, his, he talks about the triage theory of aging, that we, if we have a deficit <laughs> in these SNPs, 
we'll figure out ways to get by until we're a certain age. And the older we get, the harder time we have triaging problems away, triaging hazardous metabolites away. And the more help we need to optimize and normalize the function that is defective because of our genetics and made worse by our aging. Um, and then this has to do with the glutathione system, which also uh, conjugates, you know, makes water soluble, the metabolites and enables them to be excreted. If you have a SNP in these areas, you lose protection against your oxidative stress. I like to do the Genova, Genova Diagnostics Nutritional Panel, which actually looks at your levels of oxidative stress by looking at 8-hydroxy blank. Um, in the, it looks at oxidative metabolites in the urine and in the blood and looks at your glutathione levels. I mean, it's not something that's readily done on blood tests, but can be boosted. If you have SNPs in this area, you get an increased risk if you're postmenopausal or if you're premenopausal and you smoke and drink beyond the uh, recommended amounts. All and the SNPs you're talking about decrease the function of the particular... Well, some uh, of them increase it. They may, that first CYP1B1 increases the formation of a hazardous byproduct. And if you can't get it out, so if you have that one, plus a SNP in the COMT or GST genes that would then take it all the way out, it's a double whammy. So that's an, a SNP that has an increased function. And in some ways, you can look at COMT as having an increased function when it's a SNP, but not in this regard, really, in dealing with methylation groups and, and homocysteine, kind of. So there are strategies as well for dealing with these uh, SNPs. So glutathione precursors and cofactors. Um, you want to minimize the depletion of your glutathione. Anything, you know, uh, smoking, diesel, stress, what are the ways we reduce the antioxidant capacity of our body? By, not, by living in sin, right? By not living a good, healthy paleo lifestyle and singing freak and playing frequently. Um, again, cruciferous vegetables are all over this, anything you want to consider about breast cancer. cancer. And again, this comes up. This is another additional SNP. You might have seen it earlier on that the synthetic HRT is stressful, particularly for some of these genetic SNP weakness areas that, um, and need con um, needs con additional compensation or really better yet just avoidance. And then superoxide dismutase. And uh, this one's not so clear how to modify it, but it's suggested that people use antioxidants. And again, if you know that you have a disability in the SNP era, in this SNP, and we don't maybe know that well how to compensate for it, you can look at the others because it's all a complex, pro complex process. There's not one pathway that doesn't intersect with all the others. So. For breast cancer, again, big, wide systemic area, and if you're a big, wide system of interventions to consider, and if you're using transdermal estrogen and natural progesterone, you don't have an increased risk of breast cancer. So what we've learned is there's the two big hazard areas that people think they're gonna go downhill with if they use hormones, don't happen if you use hormones wisely, but what's the benefit to be had? And really, the, we, women, the reason that most women like their hormone replacement therapy, this is, this is the time to pay attention to. Um, it, it enhances memory. It's one of the interventions that Dale Bred Dr. Bredesen used in his study at UCLA. There are estradiol receptors in the brain. Premarin doesn't touch them. Birth control pills don't touch them. Women get dysphoric. Um, estradiol, only estradiol really touches them, and they affect both memory and mood. Um, and sleep, of course, in and of itself, and as also as secondary to vaso vasomotor symptoms. So right now, if you, if you prescribe, uh, if I pres when I prescribe estrogen to a woman over 65, I have to do a prior authorization, and the only thing that flies um, pretty much is vasomotor symptoms. And, and if they keep giving me trouble, I learn from a colleague of mine, I write on the, the um, piece of paper going to the insurance company, I ask them if they were thinking they wanted to assume care of my patient. 
and I've never had one turned down. So what's the specific that you? I primarily say I'm giving it for vasomotor symptoms. What, and your and what is I, I'll get to what I'm actually okay. prescribing later. Um, in the WHI, the combination of the two drugs probably did increase the risk of dementia much as they'd hoped they had not from um, being, uh, originally looking at the data, but when they pulled it all together, it was, was really not so good for dementia. Um, but again, when, you, when they went over the data separating the two groups, there was promisingly less dementia when you took out the progestin. And in fact, you could, there's, well, I think, it, I think I have it in here. I just get so, you know, why doctors are still prescribing progestins drives me crazy. There's a, a number of other studies, and so with estradiol, there's improved verbal memory, many different cognitive functions, including motor speed, um, reasoning, test uh, ability and performance on uh, measures of higher cognition, and 40% less cognitive decline, or it's 40% slower. It's hard to tell because this is all a process in the, cur uh, in the process of being observed now. Um, and estradiol actually seems better than conjugated equ equine estrogen, which makes sense because it, uh, Premarin does not touch the estradiol receptors in the brains. And we're left with, um, in the, if we look at the field now, the conventional advice is that women must be started young to get the benefit or the risk, um, to get the benefit <coughs> of slowing cognitive damage or they actually risk getting worse damage. And this means it's important to talk to women in their you know, mid-40s to mid-50s mid when they're actually starting menopause and tell them, yes, that there is good data to show that the earlier they start it, the greater cognitive function they will retain. Many physicians use that to mean there's no benefit from starting it later. And this is where uh, you know, Dr. Bredesen made a specific point that you can start it at any age because estrogen is one of the many chemical inputs to amyloid beta processing. Uh, and so it's part of a whole lifestyle intervention program that can enhance, enhance uh, cognition. Uh, intrinsically, and there's no, there's no reason to not start it later just because a woman is older, and that's true for all these areas that we're talking about. Uh, in looking at the WHI study, so moving on to mood, the combined hormone therapy, no improvement in mood, but we do know that estrogen enhances serotonergic activity, and it affects other neurotransmitters, and I can just talk to the women that I give it to, and it's really clear that most women actually feel better taking estrogen. When they take a group of women on estrogen and, and divvy them up to taking medroxyprogesterone or medroxyprogestin or progesterone and then switch them, it's pretty clear that the medroxyprogestin or no, just norethendrone have negative mood effects and pro progesterone is neutral. I would put a qualifier on that, that I'd say uh, 9 out of 10, 19 out of 20 women, progesterone is either neutral or beneficial to mood. It helps them sleep better, it's a mild calming effect, and I have 1 out of 20 women who have either slightly uh, depressed mood in reaction to it, and that can be enhanced a little bit by um, taking the progesterone a little earlier in the evening. Uh, and I've had one woman who said she went batshit crazy on it. And that woman would be given not oral progesterone, but vaginal progesterone, and then the cognitive effects. It's the progesterone metabolites from that first pass through the liver that has cognitive effects, that enhances sleep, calms mood a little bit, um, and can be eliminated if you give it topically, which Dr. John Lee felt was better for the bones, or vaginally. Uh, there's. Although there's some improvement for women just when they start hormone replacement therapy on a restoration of their libido, the thing that works best is testosterone. And there's, I think this is another thing where you can look at what solves the problem and what else will that solution do. So not only will testosterone be the best way to solve a woman's libido if it diminishes in menopause, but testosterone has other benefits as well. I tell women it's going to turn them 
a little less sweepy and make them a little more John Wayne-y, less sweep, more Wayne. Um, and for some women, they want to do that. And it also enhances uh, the uh, production of muscle and preventing sarcopenia, which is a hugely important factor in aging uh, and, the, and thereby reducing osteoporosis. This is a, a, a huge big deal. And I think vaginal estriol, and in this case, we don't need to use estradiol. Estriol um, has a very weak effect on the endometrium, which brings up the main side effect I have with prescribing. So I've been prescribing bioidentical hormone therapy for uh, about probably 15 years, something like that, and a lot more over the last five or 10 years. And the main side effect, particularly as I give them laboratory evidence of good hormone levels is bleeding, is uh, vaginal bleeding. Um, some women like it, getting, oh, I got one more period. I thought I was done. Could I have a baby? No, no, no. And we readjust their dose. But if you're using, if you're using estradiol in the vagina as well as systemically, you're much more likely to get a little endometrial buildup and sloughing. So I like to use vaginal estriol. Uh, it has really, you know, the urethra is part of the lining of the vagina, both of which atrophy in menopause. And what I tell women is, you know, when, when, we, uh, when you had your hormones, your urethra looked like that, and I wouldn't be able to find the opening in it because the tissue is so thick. And after menopause, I fold up a piece of paper. I say it looks like that, and that's why you, even when you squeeze down your muscles, you tend to leak a little urine. Uh, Vaginal um, bacteria tend to travel up the urethra. It's part of the vaginal lining. And even if you don't notice vag vaginal dryness is interfering with sexual pleasure, the thickening of your urethra is a val valuable um, effect of menopausal treatment with hormones. And when you give total body hormones, it will eventually thicken up the lining of the vagina and the urethra in most women, but not all. So some women conti continue to need to use some vaginal um, estrogen. I've had, you know, the number of women with some sort of bizarre genital urinary symptom that have been helped with a simple dab of estriol, and I actually have them put it in their vagina and head skyward with them lying on their back, and I say, you're putting it right on your urethra that way. Resolves in a matter of five or 10 days, sometimes problems that women have had for a very long time. And I'd like to ask Dawn this, because in my mind, this should be safe even for women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. We use that all the time in women who are on uh, estrogen blocking agents. You do. counter these effects. I'd say safely. most oncologists don't, but. No, no, that's not true. Um, I, 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 I can't speak for, for everyone, but I think that it's, um, it's becoming uh, commonly standard. used. No, commonly used, yes, yes. But again, it's compounded. So I think uh, if you don't know how to prescribe, a, make a compounded prescription, I think that's, I, I'm, I have a number of patients who. Oh, uh, you're talking about compounded estrogens. No, th yeah, this is estriol, which has to be compounded. Ah, I'm Do you sorry. use vaginal estradiol? No, I use something called Vagifem. That's estradiol. Is that estradiol? Yeah. Okay, very so good. So I think yeah. you're actually safer with estriol, but, but that's great. I'm glad to know that. About five, five ten. Okay. So um, I tried to put one of my patients on that mm -hmm. estriol, and uh, one of the local GYNs does primarily menopause work. Says, oh, I don't, you know, I don't think that's good because of all the, the, the dangerous or something like that. Do you have any idea what you saw? I didn't want to say anything. No, but you know, it's, it's, an, it's primarily the drug used in greater preponderance in treatment menopause systemically and vaginally in Europe. Uh, but it is a lot of hubbub about it in this country, and it is what has put the compounding pharmacies under fire a lot, looking into the hazard eff effects of estriol, and I know of none. It's just, I think it hasn't been studied so much, and it's not been made into a drug. It's still all compounded. When you say, like, for all women, Seriously? I mean serious. This is like me saying seriously. Like after menopause. After all, menopause. Yeah. Like, right. No, I meant for. Okay, I was like, this is all about. No. All right. Sounds good. Right. So, uh, yeah. I just yes. And um, estradiol is available by prescription either as a ring or 
tablets. And if you compound it, you can do either cream or tab, you know, suppositories with vaginal estriol. But I definitely use the cream if they have urethral symptoms because the little tablets come with an inserter and it ends up back by your cervix and that's not where your urethra is. So I'm big on the cream and talking anatomy with my patients. And um, so bone, as we all remember that estrogen enhances bone formation and so, but it's again a full program. It's not anything by itself that's gonna keep your bones healthy. You need to do all the other things uh, we know and the things that were on those previous bone density slides. Lifting the weight that Dawn showed and I love your suggestions, Daryl, because I have so many women who say, I exercise, I go for a walk three times a week and I go, I try to get them to do something more intense, but I'll just tell them to find a balance bar, a balance beam somewhere when they're walking. Or one thing my Pilates teacher said, um, when you're brushing your teeth, switch legs, but brush your teeth the whole time standing on one leg. So how do we actually do this? So we remember we want estradiol to be applied to the skin. And so if I have a patient who has good insurance that they can just go to a conventional pharmacy, I'll, apply, I'll give them an estradiol patch that de transdermally delivers one of these doses per 24 hours. And getting a little bit into the nitty gritty mechanics of it. So you have to know that they have good insurance. You have to have, go through all those, the steps of this. The, weak, the, est, the patches come in two forms. There's one manufacturer called Vivel, and it makes patches that are about as big as your little, the last joint of your little finger, and you change those twice a week. So I just talked to a woman yesterday, and she said, oh, I'd love to have a smaller patch. I said, and you have to change it twice a week. She says, I can't. I've got a parent with dementia. I have to do it once a week. So the once a week patches are about this big, and they either come in very transparent, really nice plastic that you put on dry skin without any lotion and you rub and you have to put it between here and here. If you put it up here, it makes your breasts really sore and tender, I found out. Um, and, and you don't put it back here because the skin is cold and the adhesive doesn't work as well, so you put it in the front. It also comes in really big patches like this that are about a, an eighth of an inch thick and that are kind of pinky colored and if I gave that to a woman I know I know she would never use it um, so I always ask her when she goes to her pharmacy unless I know she's going to my pharmacy um, to ask them to open the package and look because there's some very nice patches and there's some very like doofusy old clunky patches and then progesterone is available in 100 and 200 milligram capsules and taken at bedtime or with fat taken before bed so particularly if Someone has a good dose of estrogen, finally it relieved my hot flashes, and I give them 200 milligrams of progesterone, but it's not enough. They're getting a little vaginal spotting. I'll say take your progesterone with some fat. It, do, it is dissolved in peanut oil, so they can't be peanut allergic. Um, and I, and I, but really one to three taken at bedtime is usually enough to give them better sleep and to, um, there's actually some benefit even if you don't have a uterus from taking progesterone. It's better for your ovaries, reduce um, ovarian uh, stimulation and maybe reduce risk of ovarian cancer, but that's not so clear. So this is for women who have um, insurance. If you don't have insurance, all the hormones are cheaper to be compounded, particularly if you go through Women's Health International, but really any local compounding pharmacy is usually cheaper. Estradiol is $80 a month if you don't have insurance. And good insurance is between $10 and $20 a month. So you can get compounded estradiol or biased, which combines estradiol and estriol. I didn't really see any reason to do that, but I'm kind of in the habit of doing it. And I give them a dose, uh, oops, sufficient to, so this is, the time in life that this is really a better way to go is right early in menopause when their, va their, me their vasomotor symptoms are really disabling because then I can say, I want you to start with using a half gram once a day, but you can increase to using a whole gram twice a day. And if that's not enough, use more and tell me and I'll make your next prescription stronger. Um, but there's a wide variability that's not completely predictable by size. I've tried to, base these 
like decide. My dose is 0.05, and I've, so I've taken people who were, I had this woman who's t short and really skinny, so I gave her 0.025, but the dose she ended up needing was 0 0.1. And I said, I bet she's got really great estrogen metabolism. It's just getting it out of there really fast. And it's a little hard to predict, and so this is one where a woman has greater flexibility in the moment of adjusting her dose for her vas vasomotor sy symptoms, and then you can add progesterone right to it. Um, I do it separately. Well, I usually com end up combining those. <coughs> the, uh, same, the same cream. Yeah, the estradiol and the progesterone, or the biased and the progesterone. Um, so for putting estrogen in the uh -huh, estrogen in the vagina, these are the formulations. Um, you'll get access to this. Uh, okay, testosterone. I want. I like to say. 10 milligrams per gram, half a gram on soft skin every day. And then I also always say, because women are going to hear about this, topical genital application works pretty quickly for libido, like within an hour. But you can't have them do it more than twice a week, or you start involving a sex change a phenotype. Uh, sorry for the misspelling there in vaginally. The thing that I do that's really important is that you, t you want to test their blood levels. Of so first I t give the, as the hormone in such a way that the woman is happy. Um, I, the, I don't want them to have bleeding. They will have a little bit of breast tenderness. I'll tell them they should get used to it. If it's pretty bad, we'll have to adjust it farther. And after six or 12 weeks, I'll check their blood levels. And an effective blood level for the beneficial effects that we're talking about is in this range. And typically, I like the progesterone to be the, the the units are completely different, um, and these are all much lower than premenopausal women. So Suzanne Summers, Wiley Protocol, get your period again. We're way, we're talking way below that to get the physiological effects that we talk about. Uh, I, I typically look for the progesterone level number to be about 10% of the estrogen number, and I haven't had any bleeding with that problem. The units are completely different, so I don't look at that. I just look at the number. And then to know about estrogen metabolism, you can either just go to your 23andMe and see which SNPs you have and modify it accordingly, or you can test it with a urine panel from Genova Diagnostics that looks at your estrogen in your urine and sees how far along the metabolic pathway they proceed and where you tend to accumulate as a roadblock. Primary side effect is bleeding, and uh, you know how to handle that, but really it's important. It's actually good because if they do have a malignancy, it's going to make them bleed earlier if they're taking hor uh, hormones. Um, but that's really unlikely to be the cause. The, um, as long as you're opposing with progesterone, the relative risk of estradiol alone is significant. I have a couple of patients who are still doing it anyway. Um, uh, so consider bioidentical hormone therapy because of many quality of life issues for the woman and for pre and current management of medical problems that we've talked about. But if you're going to do it, I, think, I do think it is important to check the levels, modify your prescriptions accordingly. And I think it's irresponsible at this point to not also check metabolism one way or another, either by knowing someone's genetics or actually checking its metabolism. And if you're nervous about it, you can um, get an informed consent. Because, and I, my, so, um, Dr. Ann Hathaway, who you met, who was here last year with me, was writing a chapter on uh, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and mood treatment, and is now in Kelly Brogan's new psychiatric textbook, Integrative Functional Medicine for uh, Psychiatric Medicine, and uh, she taught me a lot. And she uses an informed consent, and she warns every patient, no, when you tell people you're on hormones, they're going to tell you you're going to get breast cancer. And she goes through all this with all her patients, as do I. Um, and I don't think it's well described in the literature. I think you're going to learn it from other people who are experienced using the, the hormone replacement. You, it is in the literature, but when it's summarized in either the medical or certainly the lay press, it's written up as all a big can of risky worms. And I think that the, the literature does not stand up to that characterization of it. There.
Any questions? What do you find that are bioidentical? I don't understand this. Thank you. So estro bioidentical hormones are the hormones actually that our body makes. My body, a woman's body makes estradiol primarily. That's, what, that's the most bioactive uh, estrogen. And also makes estriol primarily in pregnancy. And then makes some estrone or you make estrone by metabolism of the estradiol. N when a prescription for estradiol is estradiol, that um, hormone that I give is exactly reflected in a blood test. Premarin is a conjugated equine estrogen. It's not identical to anything bio in me, and it will not be measured in a blood test. And same, so same with progesterone and progestins. Carol, do you think there's ever going to be a randomized controlled trial of this? Is there anybody out there in academia? There is something out there. Or? Well, you know how well funded academia is in medicine. So. Yes, there is a study underway called the Cronos study, K-R-O-N-O-S, and they have a website, and there are studies underway, small studies looking at um, focused aspects of what we talk about today using bioidentical hormone therapy. But there's no profit to be made. There's no, there's no big drug company. Even progesterone, which did start out as a drug, is now generic, and so they're not making any more money from it. So. Um, let me think. Well, he, not directly, except that the choice of estrogen that you use has something to do with your tendency towards metabolic syndrome. And the more biologically, the closer it is biologically, the less that is to happen, but not specifically with insulin. But I bet we could look and, I mean, I'm sure it's been looked at, but I don't have it in my head. Okay, thank you all.